we're celebrating Women's History Month uh, in March. And tonight I wanted us to explore portraits of women. And I've chosen a few of the many portraits from the Crocker Collection. Um, and I, I, I narrowed it down to actually portraits of a single person. Because, and I'd like us to take a closer look at their faces or bodies. And when you look to try and figure out what they're saying to you, what, what, what are you feeling from them? So portraits generally are artistic representations of people. Um, they can be created in any media from traditional oil paintings to photographs to drawings and sculpture and even mixed media. Um, they can show uh, the parts of the figures or they can only the sitter's head and shoulders um, or the whole, the whole body. And they can also illustrate more than one person uh, in a group portrait. Uh, we find portraits in many stately homes, in fact, most of them, museums and art galleries, and actually in our own homes. Uh, in earlier times, interestingly, people would have only one portrait painted in their lifetime, if at all. And so artists were selected with great care and the expectations were really high. So let's go to our first slide, Claudia, and talk about what is a portrait? And I want to start with a quote from um, Simon Shama from the book, The Face of Britain. And he said, you spend a little time in front of a portrait and then you move on. But you have the odd feeling that the eyes of the painted face are tracking you around the gallery. It's a cliche, but you are not altogether deluded. From somewhere deep in the temporal cortex of your brain has come, unbidden, the act which made you human in the first place, the locking of eyes. And that really is all about portraits. They, they can represent a character or personality traits. They're sometimes realistic or sometimes exaggerate to communicate a particular idea. That portraiture can tell us about how we see people and they often show us what a person looks like but they can also capture an idea of a person or what they stand for. Portraits can uh, you know, also tell us on how a person wants to be seen or capture a particular mood that the sitter has experienced, maybe through just a facial expression or locking of eyes or a body pose or even a particular color. Uh, color. So um, Let's, there are a couple of things that, as we're looking at these that I would like you to look at too. And when you go to a museum or you look at any portrait, I want you to think about these things. And let's go to the next one, and Claudia, and that is the pose and the gaze. Now, there are three choices in a portrait. You either get a full face that you see on the left, a profile that you see on the right, or a three quarter, which is the painting in the middle. The eyes don't engage in a profile so other elements are added such as you know for symbols or something to give you some context uh, full face tends to be very symmetrical uh, also very opposed and some and sometimes iconic because that's usually how most portraits are done as full face um, um, three quarters is the most lifelike uh, it's natural and very, and very revealing as we see in the middle. Um, the gaze is also important in, in looking and understanding a portrait. And, and there are, again, three. There's the first, which we often notice the most, is, is how the subject looks at us. It's straight at us or off into space or down a little bit or eyes adverted totally. The second is how are we looking at the subject? Is it from above or below through the point of view of somebody standing in the picture or a mirror, maybe through a window? And then finally, how the artist looked at the subject and posed them. But what I've seen and what I have felt is no matter what pose or gaze, port portraits have a, a, a commonality and that is their intimacy. It's you, and the sitter. So that's the wonderfulness of portraits. So let's start with our first one. And this is uh, an absolute jewel of a painting. Um, though 
well-known Swedish artist, Alexander Roslin, captures this gorgeous woman, Anne Valley Koster, who was a well-known artist also. Uh, and he caught her in the act of painting. Uh, and the canvas is just outside the picture frame. You know, her lips are, are slightly parted and she confidently meets our gaze. I mean, she is looking right at you. Um, the, this intimacy is, is heightened by kind of the, a lack of background. Uh, focuses on the textures of lace and taffeta and silk and skin. And it's a Rococo style with lots of bows and, as I said, satins and silks and lowered necklines. And that, that was very popular. Uh, they was, in fact, so popular, uh, that style is that were adopted by the merchant class. Um, but you, and you get the feeling, though, from this woman looking at you that this is a woman to be reckoned with. And she was. Anne Valley Coaster was probably the most prominent female painter in the 18th century France. And she concentrated on still lifes and, and miniatures. And uh, her beauty and skill and upright character captivated the French court. And she was given an apartment in Louvre, which was a rare honor for a female artist. Uh, she was born into an um, uh, artistic family. Her mother painted miniatures, and her father was a master goldsmith. Uh, and it was because of this elevated status and in the arts already uh, that uh, she got her head start and uh, this aristotic, aristocratic uh, patronage probably helped her when she was young that that would hinder many other female artists trying to make it in the, in the marketplace. Uh, she became famous for her flower paintings. And as a rare honor, she was unanimously elected into the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture in 1770 at the age of 26. It, it was remarkable because there were only four women artists admitted to the Academy. So um, she, she was, and she was very highly rated. Uh, ten years later, she was named the painter to Queen Marie Antoinette, and she continued painting uh, lots of subjects. And um, she married late in life at 37 to a Paris attorney. But because of her close association with Marie Antoinette, her career suffered during the French Revolution. But she made it out alive. <laughs> Uh, and she continued exhibiting at the Paris Salon until the year before her death in 1817. Uh, her death was in 1818 and the year before that. But she still showed her still life paintings of bowls and of fruit and dead game and shells and flowers. And if you get a chance, go look up some of her work. It is stunning and uh, a lovely. It, it is a gorgeous, gorgeous painting and the jewel tones just leap out at you from the um from the painting so all right and you know what Un unmute anytime you have a question or a comment um is it hanging right now in the crocker or? it is hanging right now claudia it's in the historic building and it's uh with other uh uh paintings of of that time and uh, interesting though, I wanted to also have you point out when you go look at a portrait anywhere and the eyes seem to follow you wherever you go in, a, in the gallery or where, where you're looking, walking back and forth, it's because there's a little dot of white in the orb uh, or in the iris of the eye. That's how an artist gets a viewer to feel like the eyes of the sitter are following that person back and forth. It's a very un, uncanny feeling when you're, when you're doing that, but, um, and very effective. And hers is one of those, she's looking directly at you. She has little tiny dots of white and her eyes do follow you as you walk back and forth in front of her. All right, let's, let's go to our next one. Two ladies in white. Now I want to talk about the late, the, 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 the portrait on the left first. And remember we mentioned that in the profile pose, the eyes don't engage the viewer. So a lot of times other elements are added. And, and although there aren't many clues in this painting, 
Uh, it's kind of the style of the painting and the dress and its color and the hairstyle that provide a few of those clues. Um, the painting is done in an Impressionist style. And so that usually that would date it around the 1880s. And uh, it was also done in white in the style kind of a, of, of Whistler. Whistler painted a lot of women. He called, they were known, he was called uh, painting symphonies of women in white. Um, but if you didn't know the art style at the time, there are some other things you can look at. The Grecian style dress worn by the model and the classic hairstyle reveal some other little tidbits in the eight, 1880s and 90s, there, the tea gowns were very popular. It was a loose fitting, simple garment, it was meant to be worn at home with family and close friends if you were having tea or dinner. Um, and there were very interesting variations on the tea gown with classical Grecian inspired design for formal wear, and which this might be one. However, this one was very daring at that time. Um, the model is Blanche, Mary Blanche Hubbard, and she was the second wife of um, the former mayor of Sacramento. Um, now, profile poses for more prominent people were not frequent. Uh, however, Mary Blanche was very proud of her Grecian profile, and she designed her own clothes, including this gown. She did her own hair. So she probably encouraged the artist who was Mary Curtis Richardson to push the boundaries of traditional portraiture to portray her as a classical Greek goddess. So um, the artist is, uh, um, is, as I said, Mary Curtis Richardson. Um, she was one of California's foremost early women artists and at two, she traveled with her sister and mother to California to meet up with her dad. They, she, they came through the Panama route. And uh, she, retrieved, she received her training uh, from her father, who was an engraver. And what I found interesting is that she and her sister both studied drawing and engraving in New York. They were sent back to study. They moved back to San Francisco and opened their own engraving business in the 1860s totally owned by both of them. Women-owned business were not particularly common back then. So uh, she wed at 21, and then the couple lived in Oakland. However, she maintained her business separate from her husband. And uh, eventually, they moved and settled in the Russian Hill of San Francisco. And she specialized in painting portraits of mothers and children. And she was dubbed the Mary Cassatt of the West. So this is a gorgeous and a quite a large painting actually uh, and, and yes and uh, it is hanging it's hanging in the california impressionist section in, in the crocker now let's turn to the image on the right um this this portrait captures the model in what looks like everyday attire another white dress but the pose is different it's slightly the heads, even though it, it's forward looking, the head is tilted down and the closed eyes. Um, and it's, it, it's, a, it's a painting that looks somewhat flat. It doesn't have that depth that some of the other paintings would have or, or portraits would have. The, the palette is made up of these rusty tones. And if you notice the small little, some more clues because there's not a lot in this painting to go by besides the dress, the hairstyle, but the, she's leaning on a dresser and there's this small African carving in the corner. And the, these, these all hint to the influence of Mogli, Mogli Ivan, uh, Ugly. Uh, I, I never pronounced that correctly. He was a modernist painter and a sculptor. Um, and cubism. And, uh, and, and there is, as one art critic said, there is something Picasso-esque in the model, modeling. Uh, it, the work itself uh, dates itself by it squarely in that modernistic, figurative, impressionist mode. And it's without a lot of romantic embellishments. In fact, it doesn't have any. 
yet it's really surprisingly intimate. You, you feel like you're just glimpsing a moment. Now, new materials like nylon and rayon were introduced during this time, which was done, it was in the 30s. And they were to take the place of the more expensive silks and satins and zippers replaced buttons and the hair was pulled back or cut short and there were no corsets uh, for women. So what are you feeling from her pose and this gaze? Anybody have you want to pop in and say something about how that makes you feel? Well, I'd, I'd like to say that I find it interesting that the artist spent more time on her dress than basically her face. Mm, because as, okay. Yeah, because as far as her, her face isn't very detailed, but the dress is elegant. I mean, it's the detail on the dress. You can see where her legs, how her stomach, I mean, you can see the lines of everything in the dress, but yet her face is, to me, kind of wanting. And then it is really odd that he put that little statue in. What's the use of the statue? What's that supposed to mean? I mean, obviously it means something. Well, it's, it is, as I said, it's kind of a reflection of the times that this Cubist modernist time was happening. So uh, Picasso was quite enamored with a lot of the African tribal um, symbols and the materials and the designs. And a lot of that began to show its way into many of the um, paintings of the day. So it, this actually re very much reflects this style of the, of the 30s. Um, as I said, it's kind of a flattened style. It is somewhat angular. And her face has these very angular planes to it. There's nothing soft uh, about it. Um, so the little the little stat is just a she probably they probably had it in her their their home and it it did reflect uh, that it's just a little clue gives you the time it's like okay it must be during during the time when more tribal was uh, was imported in um, but you're right about the 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 artist spending a lot of time on the dress and it is very luxurious feeling. But is the, not, is the sketch, I'm sorry. She's not identified either. So that wasn't, you know, the typical portrait, right? Commissioned right. portrait. Right, right. Well, the title's, the title's White Dress. So exactly. basically, yeah. it's about the dress. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it is quote. Well, let me talk a little about this because you mentioned Wait, I got it, one more question. Can I yeah. get one more question? Is the little guy, is he more detailed in the picture when you see it in person? Or is it just basically like that little blobby with arms? It's like that little blobby with arms. <laughs> uh, that, that's very interesting to me because it's just the placement of where it's at. It's so, it, that's just weird. Sorry. Right. Well, th there's not a lot. I mean, as I say, the focus is on the dress and uh, a little bit on the, the body itself. But the background is just a, a, a hint, a little, a little tease on um, giving, you know, some clues on on where this woman might be as this portrait is being painted. Um, the model is uh, Helen Clark. Uh, the artist was her husband, Otis Oldfield. And Otis Oldfield was born and raised in Sacramento. He actually went to Sutter High School, uh, but he left school in the 10th grade. Uh, he found work in a print shop and he learned book binding. He moved to San Francisco to study art. And he uh, worked as a hat checker at the Cliff House, which I thought was an interesting tie-in. He, of course, studied in Paris at the Academy Julienne. And then after, he lived in France for about 16 years studying. And he came to the California School of Fine Arts where he met Helen. Oldfield was Helen's professor. And Helen herself was a talented painter of landscapes, figures, and still lives. Um, and they were friends with many famous artists from around the world, including uh, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. And um, he also worked uh, in the 30s in uh, uh, murals within Coit Tower. So you still have, you get that, that 30s feel, that real stylistic 30s from this. But let's talk about the dress a little bit. Um, it, the, the portrait was painted in the couple's telegraph Hill home. Uh, it's, it was greatly criticized, this, this portrait, because it was called White Nighty. 
<laughs> and it was considered a bit risque. And when it was first shown at an exhibition in Los Angeles in the 30s. Um, but, to, but what he did was he changed the name of this to White Dress, and that ended the controversy. But it is somewhat revealing. It is a little sheer. You can see some shadowing of the, the form of, of the woman's body uh, through it. So it, uh, so it is a really interesting study of a white dress, very different than um, Mary Blanche's portrait on the left. Very much different, but very much in the style of the day. Both of them very much in the style of the day. It's very intimate. It is. It is, Lynn. You're absolutely right. There is an intimacy. And as I said, every portrait, there's an intimacy between just you as the viewer and the sitter. It's just you're, you're getting a glimpse of this moment in time with them. Okay, let's, if no other questions or comments, let's move on to the next one. Well, I'm just going to say about Mary Blanche Hubbard. Um, I don't know. She, I, I guess she was happy with that. But <laughs> I, I don't, it just, it's just, I just can't imagine having that portrait done and then hanging it in my drawing room, you know, where I'm looking, looking the other way. And I, I don't know. It's, just, it's very, it's, very much in the style, though, Claudia, of of Grecian uh, sculptures uh, of the of the female Grecian form in a sculpture, in a sculptor, you know, they in don't, a statue. They don't look at you straight on. Well, in a sculpture, if you look at it, but if you go to the side view, this is what you would be getting. And as I said, she was very proud of her of her profile. Yep, she's got a nose on her. <laughs> yeah, she's got a very straight, very straight nose. Very much, if you look at, um, like Athena, some of those sculptures, the nose comes straight from the forehead, straight down. There's no dip in it at all. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I think I'd be more mad if my husband painted me looking like that in a white dress. Really? <laughs> oh, I don't think that's very becoming. I mean, she does not look happy at all she looks very like she's mad about something really okay we very the last painting you're gonna have and i'm in divorce court next time yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah the dress looks great but she looks really tired it's like when your husband takes a really bad picture of you you know on that's what that looks like to me well you know <laughs> a lot of this expressionism at the time this modern expressionism was to evoke emotion. What, what is the emotion that you're feeling by looking at it? Is she, is she angry? Is she tired? Is she sad? Is she pensive? Is she thoughtful? Uh, you know, it, it, it's, in, it's between the viewer and the sitter. That's, that's the whole point because you're not even sure what she was feeling. You don't know. And I, speak, oh, go ahead, Clyde. I just think it's interesting how many, how many of these teachers have married their younger students? You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, uh, that's the show we will not be doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. That could be quite interesting. Yeah, really. <laughs> or or, um, or uh, artists who marry their models or artists who have affairs with their models, which probably is most of them or many of them. I should say not most, but many. Uh, and speaking of what is this woman thinking i love this this next one coming it and i think before we focus on the woman's face let's just look at some of the other clues that the painting gives us since there's not really much in the background but what you get a lot of is what is she wearing she what is she wearing it's it's i love this you know informal alternative to the Victorian heavily corseted fashion of the day. It's, it's a, this was a, during this time, it was a resurgence of everything Asian and it influenced art and furniture and design and especially fashion. So Japanese kimonos and Chinese robes were commonly worn in the privacy of the bedroom and often used by artists to introduce color and pattern into a, a, a painting. Um, 
And it's sometimes also to showcase the cosmopolitan tastes of the female subjects. Um, but let's, um, what about the hair? You know, let's look at the hair a little bit. And it's, it's very loose and it's unusually short for the time. So what else do you notice about, about this woman? So she's wearing a, a flowered pattern kimono. Her hair is short. What else do you notice? She's got her arms crossed. She's got her arms crossed. Because why do you think, Catherine? Well, that's kind of a defensive thing. Okay. All right. What else do you notice? She's got a problem with her hand. She has a problem with her hand. Yeah, right. it's, it's off. It's could off. Could she be pregnant? That's a possibility. We don't know. She could be. Because so women, it, you often see women holding, you know, close to their bellies when they're pregnant. Yeah. Right. Like, okay. That's good. <laughs> good observation. What it's What like, else is she wearing? It looks a like jade bracelet. <laughs> jade bracelet and jade necklace. A jade necklace. Absolutely. Again, very much uh, influenced by uh, by the Asian Asian imports. You know, there was a lot of jade that came in. But also, do you think about maybe the artist position her arms that so was the jade bracelet was seen? You know, it, 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 it's an awkward position. She could be protecting herself. She um, could be in a defensive mode, or maybe she's showing off the jade bracelet. You know, right. in, in earlier times, portraits often were a way to show one's wealth, and that was done through, through what they were wearing, through the clothing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about this, but, but I know that's very common mm -hmm. in earlier works. Well, as I said, you're right, because showing a kimono meant you were wearing silk, most likely. You were probably had a lady of leisure because you were able to afford wearing something uh, personal like this around the home. Uh, you weren't doing housework in it. So uh, it was some a, a, a woman of means. But let's talk about her pose and the gaze. Is she relaxed? Is she... Is she t tense? Why don't you tell me a little about what you're seeing there? What about her body pose and then about her gaze? I frankly think that she's about ready to burst into tears. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think okay. she looks sad as well. Okay, so to you, Claudia, and I don't know who's on our iPhone, but um, uh, so there's a feeling that she's, she's yeah. about, about ready to cry. <laughs> Okay. You know, one thing about posing for a portrait, and I think we're going to talk about that when we talk about the Crocker girls later, um, is that in order to pose for a portrait, you have to find a way to sit or to stand or to be um, that you can do that for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's I don't true. know. Years in this case, because it took five years to paint it. <laughs> yeah. oh. or, or work work it over paint, uh, artists were notorious for doing a painting and then continuing to dabble at it i mean the the big joke is that even wayne tebow if he even was hanging up in the museum he'd like to, he wanted to bring his brush to continue to work mm -hmm. on it so uh they they're notorious for doing that many artists that's why you see this range of dates that they're continuing to work at so he probably painted this put it aside and then just kept working on it. So um, her your eyes are slightly down. So some people think that she's sad. Um, do you think maybe it could be thoughtful? Is she just- I think thoughtful. Yeah, think she, she, she looks pensive to me. Just pensive, good word. Yeah. Okay, Steve, <laughs> Steve. Steve says but bored. <laughs> Steve <laughs> says she looks bored. She looks <laughs> bored. She said, she's oh no, down. not not another painting. Yeah, okay. Are you done yet? Are we done yet? Yeah, a done yet. Well, yeah, done this yet? is another husband wife team, right? Yes, <laughs> let's talk about the artist. And we've talked about this artist before, it's Guy Rose. He was a top California born painter in the Impressionist style. And the thing about Guy Rose is he knew fashion. He supplemented his income as a painter working um, as an illustrator for uh, producing fashion illustrations 
uh, for a number of different magazines. And uh, with his, and this is his wife, Ethel, uh, and she's the, uh, obviously the sitter in the painting. Uh, she, Ethel was a fashion representative for Har Harper's Bazaar also, mm. and she was an artist herself. Um, and they spent uh, many years in France and they purchased a cottage in Giverny. And we know who else lived in Giverny and that was Claude Monet. And in, they lived very close together, uh, the cottage very close to uh, Monet's. And uh, Monet became a friend and a mentor to Guy and they worked together for many years, at least eight. They lived in France for 12 or 13 years, but they lived next to each other, close to each other for about eight. Um, and of course, you can see that influence in his work. Uh, in the first, the color scheme, uh, this watery Monet color combination in the background almost looks like one of a Monet painting. Um, so it's, it's, this too is, it's just absolute stunning. And you, you stand before it and sometimes I look at it, she looks sad, sometimes she looks thoughtful, sometimes she looks bored <laughs> uh, or resigned, like, oh God, okay, you know. Um, it's unusual for uh, sitters to actually smile because I think as Judy mentioned, it's hard to hold that, that shot for a long period of time. And, most of these sat for hours. You, you sat for a long time. Anyway. Um, Suzanne? Yeah, Jalyn. Maybe, maybe she's thinking, I wish I was in France. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> this, one, this one was painted in France. Oh, how uh, did you know? So, uh, uh, and he painted many, many, he had many different uh, models and he used, uh, painted a lot with these, um, these kimonos with so they were um, a lot of uh, a lot of very intimate portraits. Again, I find this even though she's not looking directly at you, very intimate. You're sitting there in this moment of personal time with her. Okay, now I think let's it's see. Fascinating that they didn't. He did not feel a need to make her eyes look the same. You know, I mean, her eyes, like all of our eyes, are not identical. Yeah, and hers are definitely not. One's kind of droopy, and the other's more wide open. Huh, so I've never noticed that. That, that I, I did not notice that, Claudia. Interesting. Well, you know, art. The the impressionists painted what their interpretation of what they saw. So, this is his interpretation of his wife. That's hey, Steve, Steve thinks it looks like you could actually slip a, a cell phone right in her hand and you wouldn't notice <laughs> the it almost, You could almost think that was a cell phone right there. Oh <laughs> my gosh. Can you? <laughs> Let's go to our next one. <laughs> no, I love that idea. I think we ought to do art where you can put cell phones in their hands. Oh like, my gosh. Okay. Well, that little yellow and white bit, it does. It kind of looks like the yellow. Okay, never mind. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go to our next one. And before we find out about these two girls, uh, let's just see what the portrait tells us. You know, let's take a look, go look at the young girl on the left. Uh, remember, remember, we mentioned that the main purpose of a portrait was to convey a sense of the person, the character, place in history, historical importance. And again, the face is generally the most important aspect of the portrait. But as we said, the image can include all of the body. And then there are other elements that contribute to the sense of the person, the lines, uh, the color, the background and objects. So um, in that mindset, let's, let's try to imagine that creative process that this artist, when he, and it was a he, was deciding how to capture this young girl. He started with the pose. So full body, standing square to the viewer, and her gaze looking straight on. And the eyes are very piercing. And they're, they might be slightly looking down, but they look pretty much like they are looking directly at you. And what's she doing? Oh, she's not exactly crumpling her, her dress, but it's askew because 
she's clutching roses with both hands. And as you can see, she's really held on to them because there are some petals on the, on the floor. Now, also clothes give us a clue. So let's take a look at her outfit. She's wearing the clothes consistent with the day and her status. Uh, it's a knee length dropped waist dress. It looks very expensive, like uh, taffeta, uh, silk maybe. Uh, a large bow is in her loose curled hair. This probably dates her at about between 10 and 12 years old because teenage girls would have worn a corseted floor length gowns and upswept hairdos of grown women like we see in the portrait on the right. Um, and how does the artist tie in the colors? Well, pink is prominent, so it's not only in the dress, but in the bow and the roses and her cheeks and her lips and the ribbon in her, you know, and, and the ribbon in her hair, uh, the bow, um, coinciding with the bow on her dress. And do you notice anything else that she has? And it may be a little challenging to see online, but She's, there's a little glint of gold from a gold bracelet she's wearing, and there's a little bit of green, and she has very brown mahogany colored hair, and her skin is very pale. The background is somewhat nondescript, but they are, it, it kind of a, a, a alludes to large undecorated wall panels, but such panels like these are, are we're from very large, beautiful homes, so somewhat wealthy. And um, so what do you think the artist was trying to tell us about this young girl? Anybody have an idea? Want to chime in about, you know, what, what, what is he telling us, do you think? It's, it's overdone. <laughs> it's overdone? You think this is overdone? Okay. You know, the other thing is, is it looked to me like uh, either an older older gal in a youthful outfit or a young gal that's got too much makeup on and trying to look older. I, okay. I, it doesn't fit to me. It doesn't fit to you. So you're thinking I, the girl on the the young girl on the left looks older than she is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I agree with her. I, I totally agree. agree. Okay. Uh, well, I can tell you she was about ten when this was painted. Oh. Not a ten. Yeah. She's wearing too much makeup then. Uh, yeah, actually, she was wearing no makeup. Too much. No yeah. makeup at all. They did not, not wear make. Did not wear makeup. This was the artist's interpretation, and he gave her some ruby lips and some color in her cheeks, which um, women used to pinch their cheeks to give themselves some color. Um, women, not ten-year-olds. <laughs> right. Well, you know, this is this is the painting, and. Uh, uh, you know, but I, you know, you look at it, and uh, is she? She's. You know, she's well to do. She yeah. doesn't look happy posing. I wouldn't uh, either. <laughs> she. She. She looks like she's challenging the artist. She might be fidgety. Uh, she doesn't look afraid. She almost looks defiant. And you know, mm -hmm. it's like hurry up, hurry mm -hmm. up. You know, I don't have all day for this. And uh, the. As compared to the young woman on the right, she's sitting in a chair in the same room, because you can tell by the paneling. And it has her halo of dark hair. She's elegantly styled. It's framing her face. The lace cascades down her bodice. It's, an, it's, it's a grown-up dress. Um, and her gaze is somewhat similar but it's softened. It's not defined. It's very gentle. It's just a, she's almost like ethereal dreamy, uh, where the other one is like, bring it on, brother. Just bring it on. Um, well, she's wearing the same bracelet too. She's wearing a, yes, very similar bracelet. And again, the artist ties in the color black to the bow in her hair around her waist, the, the, the decoration on her hat, and then a, a touch of, uh, of turquoise. So, who are these two? Well, they have a Crocker name. Huh? They do have a Crocker <laughs> name. The one on the left is Helen Victoria Crocker, and her older sister on the right is Ethel Mary, and they were grandnieces to Judge and Margaret Crocker. 
Um, mm -hmm. They lived in San Francisco on Knob Hill, in a mansion. And in April 1906, the great earthquake and fire completely destroyed their home. Now, what was interesting, this is what money can do for you. Ten days after that, the girls left with their mother from New York. So they had moved, gotten in 10 days from San Francisco to New York, and they left on a, on a boat to Paris. And it was there that their father commissioned Giovanni Boldini to paint their portraits. Now, Boldini at that time is, is an Italian artist who moved to Paris in um, early 1870s. He was the city's most sought after portraitist, and he dominated the field along with John Singer Sargent, who we are familiar with. Uh, and just a month before the arrival of the Crocker girls, uh, Boldini had painted the Duchess of Marlborough and her son. Um, the Duchess, of, that, of course, is Consuelo Vanderbilt, who was one of the, um, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I can't remember what they're called when they, 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 they bought a title and, and they saved at one of those old family mansions in, in England. Anyway, it's probably his most famous painting and it, it now hangs in the Met. Um, Boldini was known as the master of sw swish and because he had a very flowing style of painting, really rapid, really impressionistic strokes, uh, he, he's famous for creating movement. Uh, in his portraits. And um, he usually showed his subjects in somewhat soft focus, elongated. And Claudia uh, commented yesterday when we were looking at this that uh, Hel uh, Helen Victoria's feet look kind of long for her body. And he made that, that was Boldini's style, is this elongated look, uh, very, moment, very much movement, alive and very sophisticated. And here's the thing about Boldini. He was fast because he completed both of these portraits in a year. I mean, it, that year in Paris. So if you figure April, by the end of maybe the beginning of May, they were in Paris. They got themselves situated. So within five months, he had both of these portraits painted, which in some cases took artists several years to do. So he was able to be fast and he probably captured uh, Helen Victoria pretty quickly. So um, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting connection with Boldini and, and the Crocker family because 20 years earlier, Boldini had painted their, their aunt, uh, um, Harriet Crocker, and he would later paint their mother, also named Ethel Mary, uh, paint her portrait. So um, these are the two girls. They're back home at the Crocker in the historic wing. Uh, Helen Victoria has always been there, but uh, Ethel Mary had been donated recently. So she's back, she's back home. She was donated by uh, one of the direct relatives of Ethel Mary. So um, they hang together and they are, they are really charming. They are really charming to see. And uh, I, you know, Helen Victoria looks like a girl after my own heart. <laughs> like, I don't want to stand still for any of this. So just make it quick. And why don't you just take a photograph? I mean, come on. <laughs> I think she's fidgeting. Yeah, she could be. Catching I mean, fidgeting. they picked the right artist to get her down quickly. Um, just one quick comment, particularly on Ethel Mary. Um, I took a, a group of family members, three men, to, to the Crocker yesterday. And they spent quite a bit of time with these two portraits. And a couple of them, my husband and another of the men, said that they thought they didn't, they thought um, Ethel Mary looked very smug and very self important. And they had sort of a negative attitude, I think, toward, toward that particular portrait. Interesting. How old do you think uh, Ethel Mary was in this painting? Probably 16 or something, maybe. How old was she? Anybody have a guess? I'd say that age. Yeah, 15. she was she was 15. 15? 15. And I think she looks smug. I agree. I agree. Well, much more mature than that, I think. Really? So you so Claudia and and uh, Judy's husband and friends think that she has a smug look on her yeah. face. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 
I okay. think she looks like sort of placid and newly grown up. Newly <laughs> grown up. Woman, for a young woman. Yeah, got her first corset. She's yeah. uh, <laughs> right. lucky me. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say about Helen, I love her hands. I mean, she's just going to crumple up that camellia yeah. rose or whatever yeah. she has. She's, mm. you know, he did a fabulous job on her hands and the way I know that Suzanne was saying he elongated because those are not the hands of a 10 year old. Um, but you know how, how he's got her hands like just almost clenched. I know. I just, I maybe know. she hated the dress. And she just, <laughs> I, I'd agree. <laughs> I would, if I were 10, <laughs> she might just hate dressing up period. Right, right. <laughs> it's hard to say. It's hard to know, you know, both of those, women, um, they were great um, uh, philanthropists later in life. Both uh, Ethel Mary was very big in the cultural life of Washington, D.C., and she su supported many, many organizations, including Dumbarton Oaks. And Helen Victoria was a, a huge philanthropist in San Francisco, and there's a horticultural library uh, named after her. So. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever her fidgeting was, she outgrew it. <laughs> she, all right. Whatever her dis, uh, her not love of plants was, I guess she outgrew that too. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, exactly. I wonder how many times she had to uh, had they give her new roses to hold. But I, I think Bodini was so fast; he probably got most of her sketching in one, or most of his, you know, the basics in one one sitting. So. All right, let's go to our next one. And you know, we've talked about the gaze of a person in the painting, and I want you to take a look at this woman's gaze. You know, although her body is somewhat turned, her gaze is almost direct. So what are you seeing in this? Do you see soft or hard, dignified? Um, you know what? 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 What is it that you uh, that you think that you see here? Distrust. Distrust. Yeah. Distrust. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Is there a clue that 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 makes you feel like she's distressful? I is think the way she's cutting her eyes. Yeah, she doesn't have a soft look. Interesting. Okay. All right. What about what can you tell from the clothing? Anything? Is there anything you can tell from the clothing? Is she a native uh, background or? Native, did you say? What yeah. did you say, Lil? Yeah, it looks like a woven serape or, you know, Okay, shawl. so she's wearing some kind of woven shawl. Okay. What Does about? she have something in her hand that looks like a na native um, implement of some kind? Yes, she does. That's a good clue that you're looking at. And uh, before we get into that, what about the tone, of the color of the painting? Yeah. How does that make you feel looking at it? It's yeah. very somber. Very somber, okay. The hair, it, you know, it looks, what, part Indian, part Mexican? Well, that's a good observation. So she looks much more, more native. All right. Well, let me... Um, while you're thinking a little bit more, let me tell you, give you a snapshot of the artist. And this is, this is a Grace Carpenter Hudson uh, um, as the artist. She was raised near Ukiah, California and was an acclaimed painter of Native American subjects and specifically the Pomo tribe of the coastal and inland Northern California uh, where she grew up. Uh, she did attend the San Francisco School, School of Design and at 25 married John Hudson, her second husband, uh, who was a physician for a railroad company, but he quit practicing medicine and moved with her back to her home in Ukiah so he could research the Pomo tribe, especially in the archaeology. Uh, um, they, she became known to the locals as the painter lady. And most of her work focused on mothers and children. So this is somewhat of an unusual piece. And the title is Kaidai. And it's derived from a gambling game called Zaidai, 
uh, is that women played uh, using these staves, as Judy noticed in, in her hand, or these counting rods. Um, so that's what she's holding is one of these stave accounting. It's one of these things that you throw that they throw on the ground and they count and, they, and then they they count with it. So um, it's it's an interesting portrait. Uh, I find interesting about Grace and John is that they genuinely believed and rightfully so that the local Pomo peoples were on the verge of extinction. And they began preserving and recording all that they could. And at that time, no other artist was portraying this subject matter that, that Grace was. Um, and over her lifetime, Grace completed almost 700 numbered paintings. She, she kept a painting diary of each one and she numbered them. Um, and they were almost all of the Pomo people. And it, in, in it, she was preserving a lot of the Pomo's culture and history. So um, it's, it is a somewhat somber piece. Uh, most of uh, her pieces were done in more of a muted colors. And um, she, the, the, as I say, the children and mother, uh, some of them are beautiful pieces. The, uh, the Crocker has another one of hers with a child, with a mo mother holding a child. But um, it, it, it's, it's a lovely piece. And it's one that the, the face is really taking command of the portrait. The gaze is so intense. And however you feel about it, whether you feel that she's uh, defiant or um, sad or um, thoughtful or um, you know Claudia what else did you you had called you had mentioned her what what you what you felt she looked like not trusting not, not trusting, trusting. Uh, not trusting it does preserve a little bit of of uh, pomo culture and the outfit that she is wearing is obviously a, a modified um, white person's um, top. All right, so let's go to our next one. Can you guess who this young person might be? Anybody have a, a guess? No, Judy, and you can't say anything because you know this. So. Can anybody guess who this young person might be? Well, all right. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna let you know that it's, oh. it's, it's, it's the artist's daughter. Could it be March Fong Yu or somebody like that? No, this is Ray. Her name is Ray it's and Ray. She, she is the daughter of S.C. Han, and uh, who was the artist. And, you know, the first thing we kind of notice about this is that she's in three quarters view. It's a very lifelike, natural, comfortable looking. Um, you know, uh, her hands are, are look like they're just gently sitting on her lap. Um, they, it's a muted color palette, but it's still somewhat light and colorful. It's very, very vigorous brush strokes. And there's some thin, thick paint on there, and then also some very delicate washes, which unfortunately doesn't come through on the on 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 our view here, on image here. But when you see it in person, it's a very um, textural type of uh, portrait. Um, well, tell me what you think she's looking like. Does she look resigned or happy? Content, patient. You know, what's her body language? Anybody have an idea or want to think a comment about that? Pensive again. Pensive, okay. Mm -hmm. I think she looks like she, she wants to please her dad and, you know, make sure she sits right or looks right. Okay. All right. Anybody else have a, have a thought? All right. Well, speaking of sitting for her dad. Let's talk about Ray a little bit. She was perhaps as young as 14 when she sat for her dad. Um, uh, you know, and she said, um, 
uh, although the thought of sitting for a portrait was pleasing, the actual sitting still for extended periods of time was difficult. She said, I wanted to be a good subject and having an artist for a father is not necessarily glorious. Um, she had sat for her dad on other occasions too, but remarked, and I think Lillian, you said this perfectly, in some ways I felt like the times I really had dad's attention were when he was painting me. So she also commented that um, her, when her dad didn't like the color of something or felt that it wasn't the right color for a painting, he changed it, um, as many artists are want to do. Uh, and she said in this particular painting, she was wearing pink stretch pants, not khaki. But what was so fascinating, what do you think the feeling would be if she was wearing these, if, if he painted them pink? Oh, I, yeah, I wouldn't like that either. I think it was a wise choice. Yeah, the eye would go directly to the pants. You would miss her face and you would miss... Um, this very delicate young lady sitting there trying to please her dad uh, um, as he painted away. Um, her, she said her dad um, painted quickly and energetically. He used broad strokes to render his subjects rapidly. And she said it was like pure energy, as though the energy of the universe ran through him onto the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, the artist, Sin Chen Wan, was uh, studied in Nanking, where he, he was born in China, and he practiced Western painting styles and worked in oils, which was not common because most of the, uh, the arts uh, taught in China was using traditional inks. Uh, by the time he graduated in China, you know, he, uh, he, China was in turmoil. And it was caught between the nationalists and the communist politics. And so for a time, he worked as an artist producing political propaganda for the nationalist party. But when the communists came uh, to power, he left. He moved to Jamaica for a year, and then he entered the U.S. Uh, but was what, as many of us, he was seduced by Monterey. And he loved Monterey. Yes, yes. He moved to Monterey. <laughs> Uh, and he loved the dramatic coast. He moved there in 1951. He married in 1953, and uh, um, his, and Ray was born in 1954. So uh, he he hung his last show in Carmel in September 1974, and he died two days later um, by suicide. Uh, oh. his, but his friends. It never was wealthy, uh, even though in his in most of it, his wife worked to support them. Um, and, but the friends and fellow artists bought out all the paintings from his final show. And uh, he said that he he felt that he would not outlive his father. His father died at sixty three, and Juan died at sixty three. So. Uh, but we, the Crocker is very fortunate to have a couple of his other paintings, and they are uh, beach scenes at Monterey, and they are delightful. They are just wonderful. He paints with this wild abandon, and it's really a modernistic approach to Impressionism, and it's just charming. And uh, Ray is charming, you know, so. Um, hey, Suzanne, this is Pam. Hey, Pam. Hi. Hey, can I add a couple of things that just tie back into what you were just saying? Absolutely. So when I look at the colors and his brush strokes, and by the way, folks, this is one of my favorite pictures in the Crocker as well. It really does remind me of the post impression, um, very much so. So if we change in your mind, if you change her pants to the bright pink, you know, that she was supposedly was wearing, that brings it much more into like a pop culture, which would have been around that same time too. So it's interesting how he stayed with more of the impressionist look. Yeah, exactly. And, and then I heard someone mention, um, you know, they thought maybe she was re related to March Fong Yu. So here's a little trivia um, about Suzanne and I. We went to school with March Fong Yu's daughter, Zan Ji, who was a, um, an artist in her own right. So it's kind of interesting that somebody mentioned March Fong when March uh, Fong's um, daughter was uh, 
an artist. Oh my gosh, Pam, only you would remember that. <laughs> <laughs> way back machine. Yeah, the way back. Thanks for sharing that. Anybody have any comments more or thoughts about Ray? And again, this is quite a large piece too. It's three, it's, it's about three feet by three feet, and it is a brilliantly rendered portrait. I mean, it, the wonderful thing is that we can see these online. The not so wonderful is that they don't really represent how wonderful some of these colors, colors are. Okay, let's go to our, almost our last one. And this piece is, oh, sparkly rhinestones and acrylic paint and and what you really can't see in this piece also, there's a DVD and a framed monitor as part of this installation. Um, but you know, you might be tempted to walk by this piece and you're know, kind of only giving it a quick glance. But if you did, you would really miss, miss a fascinating story because this fancy dress, sparkly lady are really as worthy as any classic portraits and probably more interesting. Um, you look closer a little bit at this at this particular pose, and it's it's drawn from more classical portraiture, uh, but right away you can tell it's influenced by pop art and the culture. Uh, uh, a woman in in bold red 1970s or 80s sweater, black sweater with you know um, red sweater, I guess with black whatever those things, swatches on the uh, big shoulder pads. She stares directly at the viewer saying, you know, I exist. I'm present. I'm here. You know, serve me. Mm -hmm. And um, the artist, Micheline Thomas, says that she works to capture a quality within the model uh, of how they want to be representative. She said that she thinks the gaze from one woman to another is more powerful than, um, than, to, than a male gaze. So she finds that power that, that, that represents that woman. Um, but you know, a, a really compelling story is Micheline Thomas. And she has become known for her portrait painting done in these very vivid colors and rhinestones. And she often uses her mother Sandra Bush, uh, who is a former model, and, uh, and she uses her mom as her model and muse. And uh, Mama Bush, she's known, uh, has stood in for everything uh, from a 1970s diva to a nude concubine in another one of her collage paintings. So um, she said, the reason I use my mom is because of her charisma and beauty. But in this piece, she said she uses her mom in an Eartha Kitt pose. And she said very much like her mom, Eartha Kitt was a trailblazer. And she put herself out there um, in situations that others might deem uncomfortable. Uh, she said she feels that this pose and this, this particular piece shows in, inner strength and a sense of grit and sort of a hard edge while remaining incredibly sexy. Um, the DVD that goes with this, the video that accompanies this, she interviews her mom and her mom talks about, very openly, about how she was a drug addict and that it took a while to come clean and sober. And uh, she has made a big change in her life and and uh, her daughter has found that great strength in her mom. Um, you know, people ask, why are you use rhinestones? And she says, she just, they're just another material. She's just an element to construct a painting. So this is just, it's a piece that if you stand there and look at it, it really is quite mesmerizing and uh, very pop art, but uh, again, very, intimate very intimate anybody have some thoughts on uh, oh and i should say this she did a series of these called ain't i a woman and this one is called sandra so there's a, a quite a bit of series that uh um she puts on panels that uh she does a, a collage of different materials with so 
So well, it's very forceful because she fills the whole canvas. I don't know what is that a canvas? What what are the rounds? It's, it's a piece of paneling. It's wood paneling. But she's in your face because she fills the whole thing. She does. That is a great observation, Lil. Is that how the artist portrayed the sitter? Not timid at anything. It takes she takes up the entire canvas or the entire entire wood. Yeah. <laughs> entire space. I think she really captured the personality of Oh, the absolutely. Absolutely. And I've seen photos of her mom. And her mom, gorgeous woman, but you know, very regal, very take no prisoners. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that look is <laughs> wow. <laughs> the mom look. It's quite mesmerizing, isn't it? It is. It is mesmerizing. And that's the wonderful thing with portraits, is they become mesmerizing because it's this intimate relationship that you have looking at this person, at the person or persons in a portrait. I mean, there's nothing else that really distracts from it. It's just you and the sitter. Yeah. All right. So remember, I said that, you know, portraits can be, are many things and can be found everywhere, even in your own home. This last piece was done by an art, a little known artist and a not really famous sitter, but someone you know, and that's me. This is Petite Amelia. Oh. And this is done by my great uncle, Georges Gendron, and it's a plaster cast. Uh, it's a little piece it's a, uh, of, uh, of bust. I was four years old. I did not sit for this or I don't remember sitting for it. I can't imagine a four year old sitting anyway. Um, what so size? Beg your pardon? Size. Size. It's about six inches tall. It's not oh, very big. Really? You know, five, five, six inches. Not very big. It's just a little. It's it's pretty beat up, but he did plaster casts, which are uh, the for bronze. So it would have eventually been turned into a bronze piece, but it never was. So anyway, I just thought to get a kick out of this because. Yeah. That's yeah, it's neat. like you probably have your own portraits in your home, <laughs> but you just don't realize it. The photograph of you or your family. So. That's really charming. I think it's just lovely. Yeah. Very <laughs> cute. Okay, so that's our our walk through, uh, a quick walk relatively through portraits. And um, before I turn it over to Claudia, is there another comment on anything? We can come back to comments, uh, but uh, Claudia is going to right now just kind of have a settle in and do a, a little meditation to kind of set our evening and, and finish up our time together. Claudia, it's yours. There you go. Okay. I imagine you're not surprised that I picked this one because I... We really move into this one. So I invite you to sit comfortably and go ahead and do some breathing to relax your body. If you're experiencing any tension in your body after today, just go ahead and maybe roll your shoulders and move your head around softly. Breathe and release. And breathe and release. Actually breathing is the very best thing that we can do to relax ourselves. And you know, we talk about maybe lightly closing your eyes, but on our meditations with mocktail cocktails, we invite you to look into the painting. Maybe your eyes focus on her eyes. Or maybe you can imagine the coolness of the jade beads on her neck. Maybe you can imagine the softness of the fabric under her hand.
Just follow your breath in and out. There's no other moment than the present. The past is gone. Tomorrow is a mystery. And today, as Eleanor Roosevelt so wisely said, is a gift. And that's why we call it the present. So as you continue breathing, imagine yourself breathing in peace. And with a long, slow breath, breathe out joy. Breathe in peace. Breathe out joy. And now as you continue your measured breaths, I invite you to listen to this poem by, by Kate Leia, The Beauty of a Woman. The beauty of a woman is in the words she writes, the dreams she weaves, and the stories she told. The beauty of a woman is in the adventure she's taken, the lives she's touched, and all the minds that she's awakened. The beauty of a woman is in the caring she gives, the sincerity in her laughter, and the passion in her grief. The beauty of a woman is not in the expensive clothes she owns, her body size, the diamonds she's worn, Measure not the beauty of a woman in gold for the beauty of a woman is reflected in her soul. I'm going to read that poem again. And I invite you to reflect on your life. I selected this poem because it's about you. It's about me. It's a poem about the life of a purpose, a person of substance, no longer young, and yet much wiser because of the experiences. It's about the adventures you have taken, the lives you have touched, and the care you have given to others. It's about the amazing, strong person that you are. You face challenges, some known to others, some unknown. You face darkness and walk boldly towards the light. So let me speak these words again to honor you. Let these words remind you about who you are. The beauty of a woman is in the words she writes the dreams she weaves, and the stories she's told. The beauty of a woman is in the adventure she's taken, the lives she's touched, and the minds she's awakened. The beauty of a woman 
is in the caring she gives, the sincerity in her laughter, and the passion in her grief. The beauty of a woman is not in the expensive clothes she owns, her body size, or the diamonds she's worn. Measure not the beauty of a woman in gold, for the beauty of a woman is reflected in her soul. Namaste, dear friends, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. And now I will invite Suzanne to unmute herself and preview what's next at the Crocker. And unmute yourselves so that we can all chat before leaving. Our best thing we do is chat. Okay, so um, we've got, there's a lot coming to the, to the Crocker. Some already there, the candy store, which we talked about already, and we had a little show we know. Um, there's a show called Belonging, and it's uh, for all ceramics. It's, it's very modern, contemporary ceramics. Uh, it's pretty avant-garde. Uh, and this week, is there's the National Council for the Ceramic Education Annual Conference. And it's taking place in the, con the, the convention center. And... Uh, um, so, and then there are galleries all over the region have ceramic shows. So this one is um, specifically at the Crocker. Uh, Wayne Tebow celebration is coming back, his show. Um, and then interesting, his daughter, Twinka Tebow, um, and the art of the pose. She was a fashion uh, model, photogra uh, photographer's model. And uh, there's um, Radiant Jades. Uh, um, which is all these beautiful white and uh, green jades, um, transcendental painting group in another world, and um, a uh, photography display, um, Modern Women, Modern Vision, which I'm actually looking quite forward to. Uh, it's, it's a collection owned from the Bank of America, which uh, seems to own a lot of art. Pam, did you, Pam went to um, the, recently uh, Asheville Art Museum, and it was a Whistler, no, not Whistler. Um, I'm sorry, a uh, oh gosh, White. I just White, White, right? The the the, the White family, uh, Andrew and White. NC, and I I can't remember the uh, Jam, Jeremy, Jam, Jamie, 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 Jamie Wyeth, and wasn't that all owned by the B of A too? Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> this is so looking forward to seeing this one. And um, as always, anytime you're looking for a tour, shoot me an email and we can meet and wander through some good stuff happening. Anybody have a comment or thought or awful quiet? Many thanks. As you're always. welcome. You're as welcome, Lynn. You're welcome. It was great, Suzanne. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Great. Well, one, thank you. Thanks for joining. And I have no, I, I think Lil, Lil and Claudia and I were talking earlier that maybe we branch out from the Crocker and start looking at other, other things in other museums. Not that there's, I mean, we've only roughly, <laughs> yeah, minutely scratched the surface, but yeah, maybe people are just tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not, and I think it's, you know, it's great to know that we have something like this in our backyard. So. We do have a jewel. We absolutely have a jewel. And the amount of art that has been acquired over the last 20 years is phenomenal. I, I don't know if it's doubled or tripled the amount of pieces that the Crocker has, but I think right now they have more than 25,000 artifact oh. art objects so not of course i think there's about yeah. five thousand displayed at any particular time but um 
adding that new wing, the new, the new uh, um, pavilion made a huge difference in the amount of shows that they could handle and the amount of art and the type of art too, not just historical California. So it's okay. really branched out. Catherine, have you been to the Hagen in Stockton? Long time ago. Uh, well, actually, I went about when Anne was still in college. So um, sometimes it has really great shows and sometimes it's really mediocre. <laughs> you know, pre-COVID, they were really advertising a lot on, um, you know, uh, Cap City Radio. Um, they haven't recently, and it probably would be a waste of money to to advertise but yeah they they sounded like they had some great things going on well they have an interesting building and um you know it's just and it's on a very nice it, it was kind of like the crocker and it's not the same building but it was you know kind of set itself a, in a um grassy area so it's, it's kind of got a park around it um but you know it just doesn't get a lot of attention in stockton i'm i'm actually amazed that they can do what they do with what they've got so um <laughs> So, and I will say, you know, it's funny just talking about the Crockers, you know, where, whenever I go somewhere, I go to a museum. So I, in Phoenix, I went to the Art Museum. I want, went to Taliesin West um, in um, Albuquerque last summer. You know, we went to several museums and yet I almost never go to the Crocker. <laughs> and, that's, and that's kind of sad. <laughs> it is kind of sad because, it, you know, it, if you haven't been in a while, most people think of the Crocker as just, you know, oh, the kids went and they were in fourth grade for California history and it's the historic building. It is, it is a ginormous, um, you know, um, building. I mean, it's huge now. It's quite, it's quite big. And it does a fantastic curated job of California artists and uh, up and coming artists and uh, also the historical aspect of California. That's what they focused on for quite a while is uh, the history of California. So um, a lot of those artists reflect that. And it, it's actually pretty amazing. I don't, I know Pam and I can have a whole discussion on this because <laughs> we always look at it. Can we hang that in our house? Okay, well, we need to consider this. I mean, <laughs> and, there, and there's some piece, they're belonging. I mean, a lot of these uh, contemporary avant-garde uh, ceramics are not my thing, but every once in a while you get this jewel and it's like, wow, that's a pretty interesting piece. So, yeah. So, yeah, there's lots of, uh, I mean, as I, I even told Claudia, the uh, Chico has one it's called a Museum of Northern California Art or something like that. They have a, Chico has one too. So maybe we ought to, we ought to take a road trip up there. Only if the cafe, cafe is good. Yeah. <laughs> well, they got to have other restaurants in Chico. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Some of the museum cafes are the best. When we went to um, the, oh, what's the big one in LA that has the two museums? Um, LACMA? The LACMA? No, um, the other one. It's the guy, the wealthy guy. Oh, Arm and Hammer? It's, it's the Getty. Getty, thank the, you. Oh, the Getty. <laughs> they went out there and they had two restaurants. They had a fancy restaurant and then kind of more of a cafe restaurant. The food was delicious. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, you won't yeah. find that at the Crocker. <laughs> no, they haven't reopened their little cafe, which the food was decent. It wasn't huge, uh, but it was decent food and it, they have not opened it yet. And that's a yeah. shame because people go and they, I want a cup of coffee. I want a cookie, you know. There's yeah. nowhere nearby. I mean, and there's really nowhere to be. I mean, yeah. Not where really you're right. Nothing, nothing nearby. So, well, my friends, well, stop the recording. I guess I should have stopped.